Hey, what's up? I'm Jason, and I've been developing games for about 20 years now, and throughout that time, I've met a lot of people who wanted to get into the game industry. They wanted to be developers or designers, or really, they usually just don't know what they want to do. They know that they want to make games, but they don't really know what the opportunities are, what those jobs are, or what game developers actually do day to day. So today, I'm going to go over the different game development jobs that are available, what it's like to work in those jobs day to day, like what do you actually do, uh, what they pay, so you can get an idea of how much money you can actually make in these jobs, and give you some tips on how you can get into those positions, or maybe what you can do to get started if it's something you're interested in longer term. But before we move on to that, this video is sponsored by Millinote. Millinote is a tool for organizing your creative projects into freeform visual boards. I picked it up myself a few weeks ago, and I haven't been able to put it away ever since. I've literally been using it every day since I started with it. It's the perfect tool for all types of creative projects, and I find it particularly well suited for the messy early stages of game development and design. You can add text, images, video, create task boards, store code snippets, and much more. In my opinion, it's the ideal tool to keep your video game development and design projects on track. Millinote has a ton of different templates to help you get started, and it's generally just a really easy to use tool. So you can get started on your next project right away. Another great thing about Millinote is that it's available completely free with no time limit. So I definitely recommend you go check them out simply by clicking on the link in the description. And I wanna be honest here, everybody that I've recommended this to that's a friend of mine has already signed up and loved it, and I've heard nothing but great things from everybody. And I really love this thing as well. So again, I highly recommend it and I wouldn't have them as a sponsor if I didn't love this thing so much. But before I explain all of these different jobs, I also want to explain that hitting the thumbs up button really makes a big difference and I really appreciate it. So if you don't mind, please hit that button, hit the subscribe button and hit the little alert. So that way, as I do more videos on this kind of thing or other things you might be interested in, you'll get notifications and YouTube will just share this stuff and we'll make more video games available to you in the long term future, right? Hit thumbs up button, more video games will exist. All right, so let's get started with the video. Now, generally in game development, there are four fields or four sides to the game development process. There's the artist, the production, the designer, and the engineer. Today, we're going to talk about all four of those, and I'm going to add on four other ones that are part of the game field or part of game companies that don't get talked about often that might also be something that you're interested in. We're going to start with the programming and engineering side, though, because, well, that's what I do, it's what I've spent most of my life doing, and it's what I know the most about. And it's also, I think, one of the most interesting jobs in the game industry. Now, the game programmer is not obviously drawing any art or making any models. They're also not doing the design. They're not coming up with the game idea. We'll talk all about that later. They are implementing the game or the systems for the game so that the designers and artists can build the game. They're a part of the game, part of putting everything together and making the different systems work. Now, a programmer job varies dramatically at game companies. At a small company, you'll be doing a variety of things. You might be doing everything in the company, like everything for the game, writing all of the code from the front end to the back end, the distribution, the uh, everything for it, right? But in a bigger company, as the team grows, you're gonna see a lot of specialization. And most of the time in a game company, programmers are specialized into one of maybe four or five different categories. There are more subspecialties than I'll cover today, but these are kind of the top ones that you're gonna see. The first and most generic is kind of a gameplay programming. So gameplay programming is essentially writing the logic for the, the game. It's writing the stuff that happens when the player does a thing. So the player, like the quest system, might be part of the gameplay programming or the movement and input system where you're handling the player moving around and stuff. It's the things that are the core part of the game. Now, if you're thinking, okay, well, isn't that everything? No, that's where these other specializations come in. So one of the other ones that's very different from gameplay programming is graphics programming. So a graphics programmer or graphics engineer is usually going to have a very different skill set than the gameplay programmer. It's going to have a lot of overlap, but they're going to know a lot of things that the other ones don't necessarily know. Graphics programming includes a lot of shader development, a lot of tools development, a lot of like uh, Python stuff or art pipeline asset stuff. Um, and it's just a, it's a very different and well, unique part of programming. It's something that I find that a lot of people who are really good visually, like at, at concepting things and 
imagining what something should look like are good at and people who really like 3d math matrix multiplication there's a lot of that kind of stuff in graphics as well so if you're into programming and you really like graphics that's definitely a specialization and it usually ends up being uh, not a huge part of the team but maybe 10 to 20 percent of the engineering effort goes into graphics programming and that's because you know, there's a lot of gameplay stuff the graphics stuff is somewhat standardized most of the time unless you're pushing the boundaries the companies that are really pushing it like to the edge that graphics team might be dramatically larger so if you see games where the visuals are just nuts imagine that their engineering team is probably skewed a little heavier towards graphics or they may just have a bigger team there um let's go into some other i guess less daunting programming options or the least daunting of them which is just tools development so tools programmer isn't going to it could overlap with the graphics program which is kind of why i wanted to do these back to back because you could be doing some graphics tools or some graphics importing tools but a lot of the time doing tools development is more about building internal tools for the rest of your team building things for your game designers to be able to work faster for your other programmers to be able to work faster for your producers and all of the other people in the team in the company to be able to be more productive like you're building things to make it easier it's just like i mean in tools a lot of time people undervalue it but i mean if you imagine people going out to build a house right they go out house building and, and they're you know they don't have any tools it's going to take them a whole lot longer to you know, go smack a smack nails in with rocks and stuff right the tools are very important it's just that the amount of tooling that a cus company needs right, not customer but a company the company needs is going to vary quite a bit based on what they're building if they're building something that's really standard and they can use a lot of standardized tools sweet if they're building something that has a lot of content they're probably going to need a lot of custom stuff they're going to need to be able to make it so that they can do things faster that's really the job of a tools programmer you're building things so that like let me give a real quick example of a tool that you could build you could build a, a quest system or not a quest system but a a quest editor for your players right or your designers so maybe your gameplay programmer has built this really cool quest system in game and you're the tools programmer now it's your job to make it so that these designers can actually input the data get the data into the correct format for that quest system to work and do it rapidly so that they can copy a quest they can just you know right click and duplicate their quest and copy it and do whatever other things that they need to do to hook stuff up really easily instead of having to go in and fill out a text file or something i'm going to shut up about tools sorry i'm a little bit passionate about it because i think it's really important but it's also a great way to get into the industry uh the other two would be networking so if you want to be if you really like networking um network specialization is a very interesting job it's not something that a lot of people do but it's really important for high speed games or networked online games right if you're playing something online that needs to have a fast response having a networking engineering professional like a, a, a programmer who really specializes in networking on your team is extremely important i would recommend having two so that you have some some fallback there but having at least somebody who really understands it really well and is specialized in that will make a night and day difference over not having that on your team all right so these are the specializations what about the pay why would you dive into being a programmer and like you know, so you're doing one of these things day to day the main reason i mean maybe it's not as exciting or interesting as some of the other things to some people for me personally i think it's the most exciting but it's also the one that pays by far the most to get started so if you're starting out as a programmer or starting out in the industry the job that is by far going to pay you the most as an entry level or even as you're starting to go up is going to be programming and engineering so how do you get into that how do you get into a programming and engineering job at a game company if you've never worked at a game company before never been an engineer before but well, the first thing i would recommend is maybe go in through one of the other positions that i'm going to talk about a little bit later because it's very easy or a lot easier to transition internally into one of these engineering positions than it is to get one from outside it's also quite a bit easier to get into the tooling position so if you find engineer positions on the tools team available for a, the game company that you really want to work at and you think that you can learn up those skills or you have those skills jump on it now the last thing i want to say is that if you're going to start writing code and you want to build games like write code and build games build them get them out there and just start pushing them out there they don't have to be great just finish them build them and release them go through that process a lot 
and start to build up a little portfolio of even bad games that you've finished so that people can see that you've done things. It will help you get your foot into the door. So those are my tips for, I guess, programming in general. And I would highly recommend becoming a programmer for anybody who's interested in it. If you like it, you try it out and you have fun with it. You like being able to just tell the computer to do something and it just magically does it and does whatever you tell it to do. It's freaking cool. Um, if you like that, you like having that power, then definitely try it out. Give it a go. Programming is awesome. Let's jump on to uh, job number two, though, artist. So what does an artist do day to day? What is, what is that job like and what are those specializations? Uh, the, what they do day to day is going to vary, I guess, a lot on the specialization. So let's let's talk about them. The first type of artist is a concept artist, which interestingly, got some concept art right up there. The concept art, um, that's just some quick sketches, not full concept art. I've got some other concept art hanging up on the wall in some other areas. But the idea of concept art is we'll start off with some sketches for the ideas of what we want to have, and then draw out full scenes for what the thing should actually look like. Kind of give an idea of what this game or this area or part of the game or thing in the game is supposed to look and feel like. That's a concept artist's kind of role. They're almost like a painter or an illustrator to give a look and a feel to a game and kind of lead the direction there. Now they don't always have the the authority to do the full leading of the direction. Usually there's some some collaboration there, but they're they're drawing it out and kind of putting these pictures up on the wall so that everybody can see where it is we're going, what this game should look like. If, for instance, like in a big game company, what you'll often see is you'll walk down the hall in the art areas and it's just loaded. The whole, the walls are just covered with nice framed concept art of the things that they're building. And you can see the things from the game just up on the wall, like in their initial, original like imagination form. So if you're a great painter, a great just hand-drawn artist, concept art might be a really good option for you. Now, if you don't like the more abstract stuff and you like the more you know, fine detailed 2D stuff, that's also an option. So 2D art is you know, stuff that you do for both UIs and sprite based games so we can have you know 2d games a lot of mobile stuff is 2d and not all of it but a lot of it and a lot of i guess even a lot of games that i play now are 2d i think of like uh, magic online to play a lot of that and that's mostly 2d it's mostly um you know ui type related stuff that's another interesting art specialization um not one that i'm any good at or have really gotten into but it's also i would say probably um the one that i've seen the least so they're usually on an art team would have like one maybe two people who are really good at 2d stuff there'd be more concept artists than 2d artists most of the time it's usually the smallest size or the smallest part now of course that's because i've worked on mostly 3d games if you worked on 2d games that's probably completely flipped and you're not going to have as many of the next one which is character artists so character artists are the people who make the actual characters and you might think like a 3d artist just makes everything like they make rocks they make trees they make buildings they make houses spaceships uh, humans monsters everything and some do but most specialize in a type of thing for instance when i was at sony um and there's one guy there amazing amazing character artist um and you'd see like his characters compared to a lot of the other characters there and like all the other people's characters were great but his would just blow everybody else out of the water but then you'd talk to him and be like, yeah, well, and they're much better at these other things. So he would start to, I'd talk to him once and he explained how you know, some of these other artists are really good at some other things that he's still learning. And, you know, I'm sure he's probably blown. I don't know. It was amazing stuff. But anyway, character artists focus on characters primarily and the animated characters. So you're thinking like muscle tone, uh, animation, somewhat on the rigging stuff. I, I didn't really want to go too deep into animation because animator is also another specialization under artist. So under the artist sphere, you'll find that um, there's a whole separate section or a whole um, sub company or I guess not really sub -company, a subsection of the, of the art department that's focused on animation. And the animation will sometimes it'll be like mocap based animation, but a lot of time it is hand drawn animation where they're controlling exactly where everything's going at the different frames. And I am terrible, terrible at it, but I've got some friends who do some really amazing animation and I see it and I'm just blown away when I look at what they've done. Like, so animation is definitely another option. If you're into that, it's something you're interested in. I think it, it is a relatively well-paying position, 
but it's also one of those where it there's not a whole lot of demand for it because once you have the animations set up you don't need to keep adding more and more animations a lot of the time they'll just share across different characters you don't need to do as much but some games are heavy in animation too and uh, it all varies based on the game uh the next type of artist environmental artist so i mentioned really briefly you know, some people are better at making rocks and cities and landscapes and stuff that is an environmental artist's job they'll make a variety of things from props to this entire world sometimes they are great dungeon builders some of the best dungeons that you've probably played in were not built or designed by a game designer they were built by an artist an artist came up with the idea was like this is really neat and like a really good environment artist i would say is also a relatively good level designer they have a good idea of like this would be a cool area for a boss fight and this would be a cool like progression area and i can level it out and like theme it and make it really cool so um yeah i've met some some really really amazing artists really amazing environment artists over the time too man i, I feel like i just want to call everybody out but i don't know if I <laughs> okay anyway the last type of artist specialization and this is the one that pays the most so all of these art jobs pay relatively well i would say like in the u.s a starting salary is going to be around like at least in california like a minimum of sixty thousand. um i don't know outside of california the rates would be and those are definitely go up but the job that in the art field that pays quite a bit and the most is going to be a technical artist so this is more like the person who is is almost overlaps with the graphics programmer too. There's there's at least a little bit of overlap because they're often writing shaders. They're writing a little bit of code for the pipeline stuff. They're maybe not writing as advanced shader stuff and as they're not writing stuff that's necessarily going directly into the game, but they might be doing some of that too. They might be writing some of that code too. And they're also generally leading the way for the game development or the art development on the team. So the technical artist will often be the one that's like setting the limits for how many polygons we can have, what these characters should look like, what technologies we're going to use, what things are approved and what are things are not approved. And it's often like a near a team lead or almost adjacent to an art lead position where their their advice is so strong and so um, impactful that it, it has, a, 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 I guess, just a very big impact on what happens and uh, the direction of the game. So they'll be deciding like, what it is you're using but they're also like i said going to get paid a lot more i mean i've seen technical artists making many six figures so you, you can get way up there with with technical artists just like with a you know at the high end of programming i would say tech artists and high end programming are pretty pretty close on on the pay there so how do you get in as an artist that i don't know if i have any really good advice for because i am terrible at art i've done some art um Oh, let me go grab my art. There we go. That that's 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 about the limit of my art and it requires constant direction. If I try to draw that on my own, it ends up just being like five circles and some weird eyeballs and a scary alien looking thing. So I am a, again a terrible artist, but what I've seen is that good artists, um, tend to put their stuff out there too. They have a little portfolio that they share online and it makes it a lot easier to get a position. I think if you have really good art, put that art forward. If you have bad art, don't put that forward. Only put out your best stuff. Show your best things um, and make those visible. The things that you don't really like as much, maybe not because a lot of people that aren't artists have a really hard time understanding like the progression, unless you show it as like a actual progression. So. I don't know how to get you an art job. Um, go to some meetups, share your stuff. Maybe um, put some stuff up online. I don't know. I, I wish I had better tips there. All right, now I want to talk about the one that everybody came here for, the one that everybody thinks that they want to do, the game designer job. What is a game designer? What do they do on the team? And what are those specializations like? And eh, what does it pay? So game designers are the people who do, well, a variety of things. First, they come up with the idea for the game. Sometimes it's not just the designer that comes up with the idea. A lot of time it's whoever came up with the company. But most of the time on a team, it's a game designer or a set, a small team of game designers who come up with the initial concept of the game. And in fact, um, what I've seen most of the time is it'll be like a group of maybe three to five game designers who will break off 
and they'll start to come up with uh, the plan for what it is they think is missing in the market, what they think the company can fill, like what is the game that we can build that we can do really well that we have an advantage in. And then they'll start to design out what they think that game should look like. That's the first step of game design. And that's kind of the high level game design uh, or the beginning of game design. The job changes dramatically after that. So all of those people that come up with this concept and write up this beautiful little game design doc and then present the idea and then finally get the project approved or whatever and start to build up the team, suddenly switch into doing different things. So what are those things? Well, the first thing that they need to do is design and develop the systems for the game. So whatever the game is, it's going to have a variety of different systems. Could be combat systems, travel systems, quest systems, inventory systems. Everything that you do in the game, any interaction that you have with other parts of the game, or just really any interaction or action that you do at all, is part of some system of the game. And that is what a systems designer works on. They either design the system, so they come up with what it should be, provide that information to the programming and engineering team, and then verify that what they get back actually matches with their design. So that, that's one way of doing some systems design. Another thing that systems designers will sometimes do is input in a little bit of data. You'll find though that most of the time systems designers aren't putting too much actual data directly into the game. Most of the time that's actually relegated to the content designers, which is the other primary specialization. Content designer's job is to actually fill up the game with the whole content of the game, like right? fill in the world. You have this big empty dungeon that an artist gave you, right? Say they gave you this the big beautiful dungeon for whatever your game is, and it's empty. It's got some, maybe it's got some plants, some bushes, some rocks and stuff. Content designer is now going to go in and fill out the story. So there, there should be some little bit of pre-done story already there. They're going to take that, they're going to build upon it, add a little bit more. They're going to start adding in the characters. The characters often aren't already defined. Sometimes there's like two or three characters for this dungeon, and then you've got to come up with the rest, kind of following the theme. So their job is to come up with a lot of that information and then put that stuff into the game. So dropping NPCs in, setting up their stats, coming up with their item tables, their loot, and all of that type of stuff. That is definitely a content designer's job. Now. As the company gets bigger, the amount of stuff that that content designer will do will start to shrink. So you might see that as the design team is you know, small, you've got three designers, people are doing some systems work and they're doing some content work. They're adding a little, a little bit of everything, right? And they're even writing some of the high level story. They might be doing all of it. As the team grows and grows and grows, the systems and content start to split off, but then that content even starts to split. So you might have different people building things like the items than from who the people who are writing up creating the npcs and the people who are placing them may be different from the people who are creating them and it can get you know messy as things get to scale so it just depends on uh, the size of the company and how you, how the things are laid out what it is you'll actually be doing day to day but as a content designer you're essentially going to be putting content into the game so what what's it like i guess I don't, I don't know what, what else I want to say about being a designer. I think that it's definitely one of the funnest jobs, right? Being a game designer is like one of the most exciting, one of the funnest jobs. It's the job that's going to get you like up on stage at some conference talking about how you came up and made with this great, this, you know, made this great game because you came up with this really cool idea. And it's the one where like you just kind of get to be creative a lot of the time, although you're, you are depending on the, the actual position you may just be implementing all of the time but the at the high level at least it's the one that seems like the most exciting and most thrilling it does however have the most competition i'd say it's one of the hardest ones to get into because it's really hard to prove yourself from outside of the game industry like how do you go design something and show that you can design something without you know, doing the whole process designing it and having a whole team build your thing and releasing it so it's definitely not an easy one to just jump straight into. And the pay is way on the low end. Like compared to artist and programmer, I would expect designers are going to get much lower offers. Not always, again, there's always variance on stuff, but in general, the design pay you're just gonna see is dramatically lower. And that's again, mostly at the beginning level, as you get near the higher level and, and you've been there longer, get more experience, all of these things start to level out a bit. So what's the best way to get a design job? Well, I think that 
the easiest way to get in is to go in through one of the other remaining job options that I'm about to list. There's still five more to go. These are going to be a little bit quicker. Um, they're less development focused, but they're also great ways to kind of push yourself into one of these three roles, or some of these are actually pretty interesting roles as well. So let's go on to number four, which is the game producer. Game producer might seem like kind of a weird job. Like, what do you do? You produce games. What does that mean? You make games? Like, not really. A game producer is essentially the manager. So think of it as like the project manager for the entire team. And usually production isn't just one person. It'd be like a manager and another producer or an associate producer, which just means like a producer that they don't pay very well. Um, and then another producer. So you might have like three or four associate producers and a producer, like a whole line of management there depending on how big the team is. If it's a small team, it could be one person. If it's a tiny team, it could be you know, also the lead programmer or the lead designer is also the producer. So what does that producer actually do? Well, their job is to make sure that the project gets done and that it's on track and that it's on task. So when you see that a project has fallen like way behind schedule, that it's you know three years behind, I, I would say that usually that's the primarily you can place the fault on production because they're not doing the job of making sure that the the things that need to be done are the things that are being done and that things aren't like going off track and doing something else that, that we're actually pushing towards the goal and that everything is getting there right and getting done and on time right so if, if things are not happening their job is really to kind of come in and start smacking people around and uh, nicely <laughs> nicely smack people around they're just redirecting people into getting the right things done they also have a lot of say over just the general direction of the project most of the time now they sometimes will have a lot of creative control but a lot of time they won't so i i guess like on the creative side of like how much control does a producer have it's going to vary dramatically sometimes a producer can say like i don't like these npcs they need to all be dragons and the whole team changes them to dragons. A lot of the time, though, a good producer is going to say, hey, um, why do we have these NPCs? Is there a reason they can't be dragons? And maybe they'll have some good insight, but they're not going to fight over it. And uh, yeah, I would say that a good producer, the, the job is really just to make sure that everything is on track, that the company is profitable, productive, and moving forward really well. And I've seen, yeah. I've seen that work out really well. So let's talk about associate producers. What is that? I said that it was like an, a producer that gets paid way less, right? And that's essentially kind of what it is. They do a lot of the grunt work and not so much the decision making. So the associate producer might go through like checking everybody's tasks in the management software, seeing that make sure that everything is up to date. They might go through your bug tracking software and looking to see like, are there any new issues popping up? Are we starting to see a lot of bugs pop up in this one area? Are there any people that I need to talk to or any things that we need to address? And how can we address those? As a very common like associate producer level stuff. Or one of the biggest things they'll do is just take charge of the project planning to run tools like Jira or my new favorite, Milanote to just manage what people are doing and make sure that things are staying on track and that the project's actually gonna get done. If you don't have a producer on your team, like kind of pushing things forward or somebody filling that role, it's a lot harder to just get the job done and you're much more likely, I'd say, to fail or just never finish. So producer jobs pay pretty well. They don't pay, I would say, as well as the artist and, design and programmer, but generally a little bit better than the designer job. They're also, I think, a little bit easier to get into because there's just not a lot of competition there. There might It might have changed, but when I was back in the day, there wasn't a whole lot of competition for people just applying to come in as an associate producer. Most people who went into production actually came in through one of the other fields that I'm going to dive into now. But I would say that if it's something that you're interested in and you really like project management, you're good at keeping people on track, you like communicating with people, and you just like talking to people because that's associate producer or a producer in general is talking to people constantly. I mean, your job is to make sure that everybody else does their job the best that they possibly can and is successful. So if you're into that, I'd say, hey, look at look into the position, see if there are any associate producer positions. Don't expect that they're going to pay very well to start, but know that there's a lot of opportunity to grow and you know, eventually maybe even run a game studio because that's that's where game studio heads come from. Usually it's somebody who's doing the production work. That, that's the kind of job where you, yeah, 
it's a management job. But if you like it, it can be really cool and you can really impact your game or your games that you're working on. So let's go into the other four jobs that I wanted to talk about. These are less development focused, but they are very important to the game company and the game industry in general. The first one is the QA or quality assurance. And this is where I got started in game development personally. And it's where a lot of people that I know got started in game development. The QA team is essentially responsible for testing everything that's in the game before the game goes out and making sure that it actually works. So making sure that the game does what it's supposed to do, not buggy and not broken and not, uh, you know, doesn't crash and blow up your thing. And that it does really what, what the designers intended. So a QA job day to day is going to involve coming in, looking at the list of bugs that you have and verifying any that are marked as resolved. So like, well, what will happen is you'll get a build. Let, let me, I want to talk briefly about QA. So you'll get a build, you'll come in and there's a new build in the morning a lot of the time and it's of your game. So you launch up the game and you go, okay, well, first we need to run through some sort of a quick smoke test a lot of the time. So like a quick test to make sure that the game, just the general like 10, 20 main things also work that nothing dramatically broke. Once that's good, move on to testing the new things that have changed. So you have a list of things that have changed over the last day or since the last build that you need to go change and often a list of notes from the programmers or designers of things that they think might also be worth checking that are somewhat relevant or things that they think are, we want extra attention paid to. So go through those, test all of those things, find all of the problems with it, and then try to communicate that through some terrible bug tracking software or hopefully through some good bug tracking software to the designers and the programmers so that they can figure out what's going on. Now, to be a good QA person, I mean, really, it's just about finding problems with things and communicating what those problems are and also digging a little bit deeper than the surface level um, at the beginning. So you find a bug and you are able to reproduce it once. You always want to make sure that you reproduce it a second time, right? You want to do it, do it again, make sure that it happened twice. And if anything changed, you know, note these kinds of things. You want to be very detailed and specific and give lots of screenshots. Good QA, lots of screenshots. Now, when you're in the QA department, what I did um, and what a lot of people have done, it, you have the opportunity to really integrate and meet with a lot of designers, developers, and artists. You're constantly communicating with them. So you have a really good option or opportunity there to kind of move into one of those positions later if you're interested in it. You can see exactly what they do, figure out what their skills are, what it is that they're doing day to day, what they're good at, and start to learn those skills and kind of pick up on them. You can also, one of the things I did, start doing some coding in the QA department. A lot of the QA things that we do can be automated and can be sped up. They just don't usually do that because a lot of times what happens is people will start to automate these things in QA, make things better, and then they'll kind of get promoted and pulled out into the programming team and the engineering team, and then that dies again, and there's more opportunity in QA to do the same thing. So it's something I highly recommend looking into if you want to get into the game industry, find a QA job. Um, and start working through it and start you know, actually do a really good job, communicate well with people, go to lunch with people, all that kind of stuff. It'll make a big difference and, and help push you up there. But expect that the pay is going to be relatively terrible. I think my first QA job was paid like 20, 24,000 or something. It, it was, and I mean, for Southern California, that's like less than rent. <laughs> like it, it, it was low. So just expect, um, Expect a low, low pay on QA jobs at first, um, but there's plenty of opportunity to transition things. And now, it, obviously, don't, don't take it. It's, it's terrible for you or anything like that. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm just saying relative to the others, it's going to be dramatically lower. So let's go on to another one. Say you don't like finding bugs. You're not really a good tester. You don't really do a good job of communicating what's wrong with things or finding out how to, how, what the actual cause is. But you do like to talk to people. Another good option in some companies, now this is going to be very company dependent, is a customer service role. So some customer service roles are very integrated into the team. They're small, it's usually either in smaller teams or some of the MMOs that have seen and been on. Um, the customer service team is very integrated. And you'll see that with a lot of um, upcoming alpha games or early access games and stuff, or things like uh, League of Legends, right? Like they're customer service, at least back in the old day when I used to play it, was, was very integrated with their team. 
and a lot of these other games were they they had these like some companies though are going to outsource their cs completely and you're going to have absolutely no interaction and you're just like filing refunds or whatever that is not the cs that i mean i mean the cs where people are saying hey i have this problem in this game i got stuck here i need help and you're the one going in there and helping them or you're providing the the way for them to help and communicating with the designers and the artists and programmers or whoever what what's going on day to day so if you have the cs role where you're in that communication option or you have that communication option it can be good as well so don't take any cs job but some cs jobs can really lead lead their way up i know a lot of i know at least a couple of people who are leads in programming and design who started as customer service they went in they said hey i don't really know much about programming i don't really know much about design i like video games I'll do customer service. Started out there, kind of built up, and yeah, now they're doing great. Um, and that's the same for QA and, and a lot of these positions. So let's go on to my last two. The next one is, well, I, I don't know. It's very tertiary, and a lot of the time is not part of the company. But it is something that's worth talking about, and that's the marketing department. Some games will have a marketing department for their, their company and for their game. So if you really like marketing, you like advertising, you like selling stuff, there is opportunity there in the game industry. And a lot of the time, what I found is that the people in marketing and games, like sometimes they're not even really into video games. They just happen to be really into marketing. So I think if you like marketing and video games, it's probably a big bonus and a big boost and you probably do really great and really love it. So let's go on to the last thing that I want to talk about or the last position, which is somewhat engineering related, and that's the IT role. Now, IT is short for information technology, and it's usually the person that's managing all of your systems. So imagine you got a company with 100 computers, 100 people there, maybe it's all laptops and some wireless network. Somebody needs to manage and maintain that. Or maybe you've got all of your servers up running in an AWS setup. You need somebody that's actively managing and maintaining that and making sure that things aren't falling apart, that there aren't any holes, that nobody's hacking into your stuff. This is a very important role as the company gets bigger. If the company's tiny and it's three people, then the programmer is probably doing it. But you don't want your programmer managing IT for you know a team of 10 or a team of 20. You want somebody dedicated to that that's not context switching back and forth and somebody who's really good at the IT role. This is also a job that pays really well. And I think to get into it, you just go through the standard well, things that you would do for an IT job, but also just know about the game, know about the company that you're applying at. I think it's kind of important anywhere. Now, I think that's all of the game dev jobs. And this went way, way longer than I had anticipated. I didn't realize I had so much to say about these. But I wanted to say thank you for watching all the way to this point. And also, if you have questions about these jobs, drop them down below. And if you have um, comments or things that I missed, please drop them down below too. I tried to build up a big list of everything I could think of here, but I'm sure I missed a ton of stuff. So anything that you've got, um, just add down below. Definitely helps. And hey, it adds to YouTube engagement too. YouTube loves it. I, and it's all good all around. All right. Um, outside of that, I think I'm out of things to say other than don't forget to check out Millinote. It's a great tool that'll help you organize all of your development and design projects. To get started, just click the link in the description below. Thanks for watching. Um, don't forget to like, subscribe, hit thumbs up and all that stuff. All right, goodbye. Thanks again.